So, um, good morning, everybody um, that is in the room with us today, as well as the live, the virtual audience that is joining us through the World Bank live stream. It is an absolute pleasure to see all your faces. I see an eagerness to learn, but also to contribute to today's conference. So that's super exciting on our end. Uh, my name is Vicky Chemutai, and I'm with the Macroeconomics Trade and Investment Global Practice um, with the World Bank Group. Um, in case some of you accidentally wandered into this room, um, today's the trade conference that has been jointly organized um, between the World Bank Group and the Peterson Institute for International Economics. Um, this trade conference primarily is going to focus on discussing issues, well, as you can see in the name, driving a global trade for development. Specifically, our goal today um, is to discuss the recent geopolitical and trade tensions that threaten to undermine the security of the rules-based trading regime um, and how trade can contribute to the engine of growth, especially for developing countries. Um, because it is also Valentine's Day, I cannot help myself but uh, give a little bit of amateur poetry to kick us off. So here goes. <laughs> um, roses are red. Violets are blue. Um, globalization has brought forth so many tangible and intangible gains. So why? <laughs> so why is it, it is its perception constantly marred with so much gloom? Does trade, can trade provide some of the solutions to thwart off this global development blues? The end. <laughs> Uh, so to dissect these issues, we are absolutely delighted to have two presidents here with us that need little to no um, introduction. Um, so the first president, obviously, is um, um, David Malpas, who is the president of the World Bank Group. He has been with us since 2019. And our second president is um, Adam Posen, who has been with the Peterson International Institute um, since 20. 13. So it is an absolute pleasure to have you both. Uh, please do come onto the stage. <laughs> and <laughs> um, and while they do while they're sitting, a little bit of housekeeping. So we do have um, our sort of experts that are online ready to answer all your questions. And this is in French, English, and Spanish do make use of that live chat. And because it's, you know, this is such a big conference discussing trade um, issues, don't be shy, like fire away. Um, this is an opportunity for everybody to get those hot questions answered. Um, David, please do take the fire chat away. Can globalization be reshaped to accommodate national interests um, while maintaining trade as an engine for green, resilient, um, and inclusive development? Thank Thanks very much, and thanks for the uh, Valentine's uh, uh, poem as well. Um, and really good to be here with uh, Adam Posen. Um, we're going to have a super uh, intellectual uh, conversation because the world's at this point where global growth isn't enough. We recognize that trade is part of the solution, uh, but we don't have the exact modalities to get there. Um, so. I'll state a view, and then I'm really interested in Adam uh, uh, modifying it and expanding on it as he has done in uh, in really good writings about trade. So. <clears throat> Um, we know from economics that trade is a powerful way to uh, uh, to specialize, and that includes across borders. And so as people look at the word globalization, uh, it's a necessary part of being on one planet, uh, and it means that there's specialization across country boundaries and indeed across continents. So we need to have continents trading across oceans in order to have the full benefit from uh, from economic efficiencies. Then that gets us into how far do you want to go with it in terms of dependency uh, on Russia for energy or dependency for chip making on, on individual countries. And so there needs to be a, 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 a rational thought process of, of, uh, where, of where do you want to go with your trade supply line. Lines. And maybe that got overdone. Certainly, it did get overdone in the uh, 
2000s, 2010s, and even maybe before that in terms of the dependence on Russian energy. Uh, so if we take that as the context, then we need to recognize there's this huge value to people around the world from trading within their uh, village uh, to within with a neighboring village uh, within their nation uh, and then especially to keep in mind that cross-border trade is critical to specialization. We can't go to the point of saying self-sufficiency country by country is a workable economic model. So that I'll state that as the premise, and then that leaves us with maybe part of today's discussion is to push back what our my worry is that we see countries around the world putting in export controls putting in subsidies that keep their that are meant to provide self-sufficiency for their domestic production, but they end up being super expensive uh, for them on their fiscal deficits. Uh, and so we have to, in some way, draw rational lines in terms of how far we want to go with, uh, uh, with, with those barriers, import and export barriers, subsidies that are, that are, uh, uh, that are, that are uh, uh, hugely expensive and and distort the trade. So with that, let me go to Adam. Where are we going to go with this? Yeah. Thank you, David. Um, let me just say, on behalf of the Peterson Institute for International Economics, we're very grateful to get to work with the bank, not just on today's event, where we got to work with President Malpass, Managing Director Pangestu, and others, but that we work on a working basis with numerous departments at the bank as well. And, and this is because we don't agree on everything but we share the basic values that I think David implied and in some places explicitly said, which is when you're talking about eliminating poverty, when you're talking about development, and for that matter, when you're talking about sustainable green growth, economic efficiency matters, economic freedom matters, and it's very hard to get those without trade. So if I can be conceptual for a moment, you know, as David, I think, rightly said, we overdid it in supply chain extensions and specialization and putting supply chains in places that for geopolitical reasons were not wise. But I think it's important to understand that wasn't because of some diktat from the bank or the fund or, or the neoliberals like me. It was organic. It was because you had multinational companies and investors and businesses in developing countries who were out there saying, I see an opportunity. You know, the the CFO of whatever large global economy country says on a on a quarterly earnings call, we're going to reduce costs ten percent over the next year, and that comes down four levels to somebody who has a plant, who says, "Oh my God, I got to cut costs thirteen percent," and then they realize that there was somebody in Turkey or Thailand or Tobago or I can't think of a T in Latin America at the moment. Togo. Anyway, Togo. Um, which isn't Latin America, but it's another T. Anyway, and they figure out, I can really save money by doing this. And then after that happens, you start meeting other people in that country. I mean, this wasn't some, some deep decision to, to spread supply chains thin. It was an organic response to the opportunities that were out there in the world that were very large. And so it's reasonable that at some point, the public aspects of this, like, resilience in the face of pandemics or worries about, let's call them rogue regimes, start to come in and we're not completely taken into account. But there's a real reason why this happened and it really was a benefit both ways. We have vast amounts of research showing that where countries and more importantly, individuals and communities are part of global supply chains, they get higher wage work, they get more investment, they get more integrated, they get benefits. So let me step back a second, and I'll trust David to cut me off if I go too long. So why, going to Vicky's excellent poem and intro, why does it have such a bad rap? And I think to the degree there's a bad rap in good faith for trade and development, it goes back to, as always, with intellectuals fighting the last war. There was this sense of overselling the benefits of trade and overselling what used to be called 30, 40 years ago, the Washington Consensus. And, and so, of course, there was hypocrisy. Of course, there was recognition of problems. 
But that has now persisted and grown in ways that are not justified. And so when we think about what trade does, David put it one way, let me put it a different way. What you need to grow is you need enough competition, enough technology, and enough investment of long term to let your country and your companies adapt. If you cut yourself off from new technology, if you cut yourself off from the world, you not only miss opportunities, you engender more corruption, you engender worse choices, you engender less competition. This is why econometrically, you can't always come up with a simple relationship, trade equals growth. Because what really equals growth is competition, anti-corruption, adoption of technology. Trade is very useful for that. And conversely, it's very difficult to achieve those if you're not open. But it is possible to achieve those without trade. It is possible to achieve those in other ways, but I wouldn't bet on it, particularly for a small economy. Trade is the access to the best practices, the best technology, the best competition. It's about what trade does to your own country and your own economy and not so much what you export. So we accept that. Um, I, you're being a little too nice on one point. You described well the, that uh, some part of globalization was driven by profit or by actual yeah. benefit to people, to workers, to to uh, the the uh, uh, competitiveness and so on. But but now we're at the point, or not even now, always throughout. There is the risk of uh, stakeholders finding ways to use the system yes. in order to beef their own profit right. but at the expense of the of the uh, entire of the whole uh, that gets into uh, import barriers are a classic one where it benefits my com right. company to have the barrier uh, and uh, that now we have <clears throat> the export uh, blockages that are being put on which benefits someone, I mean, you can trace it back to the the dollar and cent right. cents benefit to bad practices. Right. And so it's not enough, I think, to, to uh, say, uh, you know, there was logic to the expansion of global trade because it was making money. There's also logic to the barriers that Absolutely. are being put in now. So we have to have some kind of a system to evaluate the barriers. And so we are using right. language, for example, on subsidies to say if a government is putting in subsidies because of the current crisis, they need to be time bound uh, and they need to, need to be targeted. So if there are subsidies around the world that are being put in place that aren't, uh, meaning they benefit all of the people at giant expense and they don't have a, an end point, they're going to massively distort what the economic development might be. So that's one area that we can say we're against, uh, untargeted, uh, uh, un-time-bound un, uh, uh, subsidies. The reality is those are being put in place by governments every day now, and we try to speak up yeah. uh, against them. Uh, another area of that is the, uh, I mentioned the term self-sufficiency, but there is this big wave to say, we ought to make each component within our own country. Yeah. Uh, and so that's uh, massively costly. Yeah. Uh, and then you mentioned the, uh, you know, as we think about uh, the agricultural subsidies that are going on, we have this these giant distortions from, uh, let's put it on the table, from uh, uh, from uh, quotas, from biofuels, yep. uh, from from very expensive practices that end up distorting markets. So. What's the system going to be to try to restrict to try to get us back on track toward the good side of the profit right. motive rather than maybe the the one that subtracts from the whole? No, no, you're absolutely right, David. And I commend the bank for its work tracking and pointing out the subsidies. And I think it's very important what you just said, not only that there are subsidies that <clears throat> it may not be corruption per se, but legally, but is subverting the public good and public money for the sake of entrenched incumbents are politically favorable. And I think it's also important, I was trying to go to the general issue of trade, but I think it's also important to recognize what you just said, that right now, whether it's the US 
or developing kind of economies, the action is much more on subsidies than on tariffs. And it is potentially much more distorting. Mm. Tariffs, we have a framework, we can track them. They're not good, <laughs> but, but there's, there's ways of taking them down. Right now, we don't have a system for mutually taking down subsidies the way we once did and still to some degree mm. have on tariffs. I, I just want to go one step further. Let's take the green example. Um, so there is obviously an insufficiency of public investment throughout the world, but particularly in the developing world, for climate change mitigation, climate change adaptation, new green and new energy technology. And the bank is confronting that along with others. The subsidies reaction is probably not the right reaction in a very costly way because subsidies tend to be tied to discriminatory practices. It's about production or ownership of companies in my territory. And what we know from the adoption of the internet and digital, and we know needs to be true for green energy, is what matters is widespread adoption of best practices and it's the households and the companies throughout the economy gaining from that. It's not the value of the production. And so what matters is that we have economies of scale and competition for technologies and not fragmenting standards, which if we get all the subsidies out there, we're going to be actually subverting the progress of green, pro of green technology and green energy. We're going to have countries bank as referred to often thick borders and that means a lot of things but essentially we're creating a set of thicker borders for grids for interoperability of technology for adopting the newest technology for spreading at a common standard for getting it cheap enough that people can buy it on a large scale so even if your goal is well intentioned to increase private, public investment and then private investment in green technology, doing it through subsidies that involve trade distortions is the wrong way to go. Yeah, that's, that's huge. And your point that there's no system to try to fight this, or and not as much of a system as there was on, on tariff barriers. The original part of the uh, of GATT or of yeah. the was was a tariff focused and unfortunately it excluded agriculture yeah. in most cases it was a yeah. good or uh, industrial exchange we're even losing that I fear on it because industrial policies are really aimed at saying well we know that there are not supposed to be tariffs, but we need to have protection right. for this industry because it's a key industry. Can I pick up on that and try and turn it, as you said, about modalities going forward, a little bit more positive. So I see my colleague from Peterson, Jeff Schott here, who'll be on the next panel, and he has the scars from the Tokyo round trying to negotiate a subsidies code that didn't work then. And, so we, and then we know that the US, Japan, and EU were talking about a subsidies code in the previous administration, and for whatever reason, that hasn't gotten picked up. So there's room for it to do it. But this is about development. So let's talk about the countries that are not China and the US, that are not the rich countries. Um, I think there are a few places of positive movement we can think about. The first one is it's important to have the multilateral spirit, if not literally multilateral practice. That is, you try to involve yourself in deals and standards that are transparent, that are equally applied across all members of deals, that involve as many different countries at different types as possible, and that, I, and Mari reminded me, thinking of the WTO as a club of clubs that, that, that you, your club may not include everybody on a given thing, but that it's consistent Uh, there we are. People can join if they meet the standards. And so it doesn't have to be literally a multilateral trade round, let alone a development trade round. But it has to be African common free trade area, which the gentleman from Kenya will be speaking about perhaps a bit at the next session. It's about EU doing deals with Mercosur, with, with Africa, with Latin America, that are, that are with India, that are inclusive. It, it, it's all, again, it goes back to this idea of discrimination. That's the core. That you want discrimination versus economies of scale, large scale standards. There is nothing that helps the developing world when you go that route. 
Alternatively, even if China or US are not playing along in a constructive way, there is room for the rest of the world to continue to gain and let them exclude the US and China, for God's sake, and, and, and gain and force US and China to come along. And that's true of what we're seeing with CPTPT, for example. Second point, um, I had the privilege to speak the other day at the FCI, which is an important part of the World Bank, uh, sort of three-year retreat. And I was followed on the program later by the distinguished economist Richard Baldwin, who I'm proud to say is now affiliating with Peterson. Uh, um, but anyway, we both talked about Richard in more detail than I. The opportunities in services. And again, the, the panelists in the next session will talk more about this. But, you know, in a world where if China and the U.S. and Russia are creating fragmentation of various sorts, the need for business services to adapt and get you across borders and get adoption of technology and, and get around, frankly, whatever arbitrary divisions China and the U.S. impose on the rest of the world becomes all the more critical. And third countries, as it were, which of course spans a huge range of the world economy, have the opportunity to move in this area. And because services trade has not yet been very well regulated, there's room for plurilateral agreements that can engage the developing world. And finally, in this sphere, services trade is the biggest substitute for migration we got. Now, I know the World Bank's WDR this year is going to be focused on migration. We've seen some of that work coming. Our colleague, Michael Clemens, is doing some work with the World Bank on this. There are huge gains to be had from migration, but let us accept, in my view, sadly, but let us accept that there's not going to be large, peaceful mass migration in the next few years. The biggest, the next biggest gains to be had are free trade, freer trade in services involving developing country populations. And it's doable because China and the U.S. have chosen not to play in a perverse way this creates mm. much more room for the rest of the world to play. Uh, those are, th th that's a challenging mix. Uh, and so to clarify, the, we have our WDR, the World Development Report, coming out shortly that is focused on migration uh, and uh, uh, from the standpoint of uh, labor m moving from one place to where there's maybe more capital or more jobs, but also the uh, the push side of it because of the fragility going on around the world, very trouble, troubling uh, uh, times. Um, we're going to wrap, but you gave us, um, gave us a big hook to go into the positive side of this. I mentioned things that we're trying to get countries not to do, which is the subsidies, for example, that are not Time, that are not targeted or not time bound. So reducing that for all the reasons that that's important. The export controls stop uh, stop wherever possible because of the distortive effect. Uh, as the as uh, trade in uh, climate friendly products emerges, try not to have them driven by protectionism um, so those are some of the some of that and you mentioned the importance of uh, avoiding the fragmentation of standards it's it, it's uh, important in world development that there that people find ways to have their standards be somewhat common so that trade can go across borders uh, so and you mentioned plurilateral on uh, services so I want to add things that we've been working hard on our trade finance so as as trade finance broke down during during COVID or even prior uh, IFC has stepped in the bank has stepped in and MEGA has stepped in and so we've had this giant surge in our own trade finance and we are hoping uh, that that can be catalytic and bring private sector to trade finance back into the market as uh, circumstances um, uh, stabilize. But we recognize the importance of trade finance in allowing imports and exports of all kinds. And then I wanted to mention also uh, trade facilitation, which is a critical part. I think I saw Mona here, yep. Mona Haddad. Uh, and so we have a big, uh, 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 a big 
push within the bank. We've got lots of uh, important people. Mari is here, Jurgen is here, uh, uh, and uh, around, the, around the room. People working hard every day on making the system work. And so as we think of trade facilitation, uh, it's the idea of identifying the barriers between countries, often neighbors, but it can be across a continent. Uh, and then what are the concrete ways that we can reduce that, reduce those barriers? That would be customs harmonization, for example, which is so important. You know, across the world, we see borders. Well, you mentioned the term thick borders, which I think was a World Bank. Yeah, I think uh, in invention in a maybe a previous WDR World Development Report that talked about the idea that if it takes a long time for a truck to go across a border, you've lost some part of the of the benefit of trade. That's especially true if it's a perishable item. If you're trying to grow vegetables in one country and get them to another and it takes 12 hours to get through the border, uh, that's not going to work because it uh, diminishes the value of the product. So we are working really throughout the developing world to try to uh, uh, try to facilitate trade and that includes regional you used a fancy term plurilateral but it can be regional and it can involve multiple players that decide on rules that make it possible to have a lot more trade and I guess a, a closing thought I have and then maybe you you have and I know we're, we're going to have a really good panel right now uh, but uh, is that the, the value added from this framework is gigantic and that, I mean that goes back to the original purpose of trade is to allow and create the value added from people specializing uh, in services, in goods, in agriculture across their, across their framework. And we ha desperately have to avoid losing that as countries look to be self-sufficient, that you're going to lose a giant part of your growth potential if you, if, if you go down that route. So, Closing? Yeah. Just to say, and what David cited is, of course, something I completely agree with, and the bank has a great agenda here. What I'd like everybody to take away is if trade facilitation and trade finance have outsized returns, and all the evidence is that they do, that says that there are $50 bills on the ground waiting to be picked up if we just enable them to pick them up. And so the fact that the trade will happen if we just do a few things tells you how big the gains are. And the other piece yeah. is that as long as we care about human welfare, not about welfare of borders or nations, it's about increasing opportunity for individual workers and individual businesses. And, and all the talk that the U.S. or others engage in about the damage to trade and that, that is a rich country problem at best and a self-serving, self-interested obsession at worst. For developing countries, if it's about human opportunity, you want more open borders. Thank you. Hi. Great. Someone guide me. <laughs> what, what do we do? Who's in charge? Uh, yes, you you're, are. You're, you're, the yes, master you are. Of, you're the master of ceremonies. Huh. Um, no, well, thank you very much. I mean, that, that was as fiery as it gets from helping us understand why protectionism really needs to come down, how important trade facilitation is, and how subsidies are really just growing. And I really liked what you said about, you know, subsidies almost taking over tariffs because we... Yes, the, the increasing worrying trends we need to think about. But thank you very much for that. Um, so I'm going to introduce the next session. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. So in the second phase of the trade conference, we shall be having a panel discussion to explore the challenges and opportunities for business and how developing countries can help farms continue to rely on trade as an engine for growth and development, especially in developing countries. So to moderate this discussion, we are absolutely honored to have Mari Pangestu, who is our Managing Director of Development Policy and Partnerships at the World Bank, Mari Senang Melihatmu. 
<laughs> um, and our esteemed panelists include, um, we have with the research perspective, Jeffrey Schott, who is a senior fellow um, at the Peterson Institute for International Economics, um, working on international trade policy and economic sanctions. Jeff, an absolute pleasure. Um, and then with a the policymaker perspective, um, our next panelist is Mr. Alfred Kombuda Ombuda, who is the Principal Secretary of Trade with the Government of Kenya. Alfred Karibusana. Um, and critically, which is very important, as we all know, with the private sector uh, perspective, our other panelist is Sunny George Verghese, who is the founder <laughs> and group CEO of Olam International Limited, a leading food and agribusiness headquartered in Singapore. Sunny Hen Gao Xiang Jian Neodo. I must have butchered it. <laughs> um, and then um, also, as you can see on the screen, with the past perspective of trade multilateralism, we have Annabel Gonzalez, who is the Deputy Director General at the World Trade Organization. Annabel, muchas gracias por estar presente. <laughs> Esther en casa. <laughs> uh, Mary, over to you. Terima uh, kasih. Thank you, Vicky. <laughs> Uh, I think we've uh, had a good sweetener, not just the chocolates in front of you, but we've had a good sweetener uh, from David and Adam to set uh, the stage uh, for our uh, really uh, very well-packed uh, panel discussion. Uh, and we heard uh, about continued uh, premise for open trade that will deliver growth and development, uh, but uh, realizing the challenges uh, that we face uh, in terms of increased protectionism, but also the new opportunities from services and so on. Uh, so I think we are going to discuss in this panel what are the challenges and opportunities for businesses and developing countries, and what are the important uh, policy and institutional responses, whether national, regional, uh, or global, so that we can can still uh, leverage uh, trade for development. This is really the aim uh, of the panel. I think Vicky already uh, introduced the four excellent panelists, uh, and we are uh, hoping to get the government policy perspective, the academic perspective, the WTO perspective, as well as the private sector pr perspective from uh, those who are uh, online as well as those physically uh, with us here today. Uh, so we have Alfred and Jeff uh, with us here physically and Annabelle, uh, good afternoon Annabelle in Geneva uh, and Sunny in Singapore I guess. So good evening uh, to you uh, joining us uh, online. So uh, let me start with the first round of questions. Uh, to get uh, all of your perspectives on the current set of challenges that was uh, already well outlined uh, by David and Adam, but also the opportunities uh, for reshaping globalization that will, that will lead to still uh, trade uh, delivering on development, and how to respond uh, from your uh, different perspectives. So let me start with Sunny. Uh, we have heard about the disruptions of global s supply chains, which was caused by COVID and uh, the war in Ukraine, which has really called for resilience, increased resilience, diversifying sources, uh, and a shift from just in time to just in case. Uh, how is your company adapting to a world of significantly heightened risk, be it climate, geoeconomic, or uh, pandemic-induced? Do you think these risks will have an enduring impact on your business? Uh, please, all panelists, you have uh, three to five minutes uh, each to answer your questions. Over to you, Sunny. Uh, so you're muted. Sorry. Uh, thank you, Mari. And it's an absolute pleasure and privilege to uh, be here this evening. Uh, it is midnight, past midnight in Singapore, so uh, the, the uh, session has uh, kept me awake, uh, given the uh, importance of the issues that we are all uh, confronted with and dealing with. So there is absolutely no doubt in my mind and uh, based on our experience that all of the events that you mentioned uh, or all of the key trends that you mentioned have a direct impact on how we serve our customers. So by way of a very quick introduction, we are a leading global food and agribusiness. We grow, we originate, we process, we manage the logistics, and we deliver to over 23,000 customers worldwide, about 47 agricultural raw materials and food ingredients, uh, everything from cocoa and coffee to palm and rubber and cotton and 
uh, various kinds of uh, raw materials and ingredients. Uh, obviously, as population is growing, per capita incomes are growing, as uh, uh, we're having a more younger demographic in terms of a younger population, the urbanization trends, the change in dietary habits, the demand for food feed peoples is also growing. So how do we meet the growing demands of a larger population without destroying the planet and being uh, and, uh, climate positive, nature positive, and livelihood positive as we seek to meet these growing demands of food and feed demanded by a growing population? So the first is we already had these supply chain disruptions, which was a result of COVID pandemic with uh, the availability and more importantly, the access to the food from where it is produced to where it is required being disrupted as a result of the COVID pandemic. And of course, the Russia-Ukraine war has added fuel to the fire and exacerbated the uh, situation in terms of the war-induced supply chain disruption. Uh, Russia and Ukraine put together is one of the six big bread baskets in the world. Uh, the grains and oil seeds, uh, that Russia and Ukraine produces and feeds the rest of the world is about 105 million tons out of a global trade of 400 million tons, which is about 26% of global trade in grains and oil seeds just comes from these two countries. And that has impacted uh, the global uh, trade flow in this. Uh, in the case of Olam, in 2021, we were uh, supplying about 41 million tons in 2022, our volumes have come down to 38 million tons. We were not able to, as a result of these supply chain disruptions, we had a lower contribution of supply for wheat and corn and barley and other uh, oil seeds that were put in Russia and Ukraine. We were able to make that up by our presence in other trade corridors and trade flows. But overall, our volumes declined by about 3 million tons although the source of that decline in volumes were attributed about 5 million tons to the Russia and Ukraine disruptions, but uh, other trade flows grew for us. So that is a direct impact. In terms of the uh, climate change and how it's impacting our trade flows is also very clear. In Olam Agri, uh, one of the three uh, operating entities within Olam, uh, in 2022, we had uh, greenhouse gas emission footprint of 61 million tons. Out of the 61 million tons, only 0.8% was uh, scope 1 and 2, and 99.2% uh, was scope 3. And since we have committed to a net zero commitment by 2050, we have to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions by 50% by 2030, which means as our greenhouse gas emissions will grow from the 61 million tons to 73 million tons by 2030, we have to bring it down to 31.5 million tons, which means we have to reduce 36 million tons in the next eight years, which is 5 million tons a year. If you value it at $40 a ton, which is what our major shareholder, Temasek, has assigned as a carbon cost for us, that cost of carbon is $200 million, which is roughly about uh, more than half my after-tax profits. So there isn't a bigger priority for me or my CFO, but to first try and mitigate and reduce and abate our greenhouse gas emissions, if we have to be true to our purpose of transforming food feed and fiber system so that we can have a more sustainable and food secure future for all. Uh, last year in 22, 70 countries have imposed various export bans and other tariff and non-tariff barriers to maintain food security in the countries. 179 countries have had food price inflation significantly higher than the headline inflation of 9, 10, 11%. Lebanon's food price inflation last year was 178%. So many countries have suffered very high levels of food price inflation and food insecurity. Yeah. The way we try to manage this disruption and navigate through this is to follow a rule that we will be present in at least 90% of the producing countries for every uh, raw material that we are trying to supply to our customers. So either we are growing them in these producing countries 
or we have direct farm gate origination and sourcing from about 5.2 million farmers around the 67 countries that we are present in. And uh, as a result, we are able to compensate if there is some supply disruption from one producing country or region by being able to source more of similar quality and grade of raw materials from other producing countries. And yeah. that's the yeah. way we are trying to navigate through this. Uh, thank you, Sunny. So uh, diversification uh, and uh, I, the longer term issues uh, on climate that you're addressing. Now, let me turn to you, Alfred, uh, uh, as a policymaker uh, from a developing country. Uh, how important is trade uh, for development and poverty in your country? And how are all these disruptions of supply chain affecting trade in your country? And what are some of the key challenges you face uh, in terms of designing your national policy actions uh, to make sure that you know, engine, uh, the trade continues to be the engine for economic development? Mm -hmm. uh, thank you so much uh, and uh, thank you for having me here this uh, morning for this panel uh, on uh, global trade and development. And uh, I will straight go to uh, the point that, um, you know, global supply chains over the last few years have obviously had an impact on countries' ability to trade everywhere, rich, developed poor growing nations. But it has also hit uh, the developing nations quite hard particularly in some sectors whereby a lot of the raw material, for example, is accumulated from elsewhere, and some of the processes then are finished within our countries for onward destinations into certain markets. The textile industry is an example, and the apparel industry is an example. So those disruptions uh, have been there. But aside from COVID, we should also appreciate the fact that African and developing countries have been participating in global trade at uh, less optimum levels uh, even before the pandemic. And therefore, my point there is that there are a number of structural and developmental issues that probably need to be taken a look at uh, in the context of disruption of global supply chains, but also in the context of sort of the more foundational structural issues that African countries, for example, will need to address in order to basically benefit more from uh, global uh, trade. So the disruption of supply chains has been uh, uh, critical in our ability to be able to finish accumulation and to supply markets. But at the same time, we are beginning to see a situation whereby there are conversations that are going on amongst uh, a number of developed countries and other countries that are beginning to become more sensitive around where the uh, supply chains are coming from. Even if, for example, a country like ours has uh, preferential uh, uh, um, um, access to certain markets, we are beginning to see conversations around where countries are more interested to find out where are you getting your raw materials from? And are you getting those raw materials from places which are compatible to our foreign and external trade policies and so on and so forth? So this raises a further interesting conversation that must be had. It is potentially an opportunity for countries like Kenya to basically take a look at this and try and make a pitch for investment investment whereby we are then able to have more of the cost build-up structure for any goods that we are trying to export being done from within Kenya and if not from within Kenya from within the region. So that's one of the other things that I would like to raise. Another point that comes up from a policymaker's perspective is some of the shocks that we are seeing over the last few years that is affecting our company's uh, ability to export and get settlement in external markets. I'll give you a, a tangible example. Tea is our largest export. We export about $1.2 billion of tea from an economy of about $100 billion. So it's significant. Our exporters are currently not able to easily get settlement because there are no dollars available. Mm. And we have containers of tea stuck in a number of ports for which they're still waiting for settlement months on end. So one of them, the key thing that has to be addressed in the context of COVID, a post-COVID world, uh, some of the global crises in terms of the wars and so on and so forth, is how do we ensure sustained settlement for traders that are basically coming from developed countries and basically have little muscle around which to basically have long working capital. And if I can reflect further on this particular issue, 
I would basically say that we have lots of opportunities in this new emerging order. Environmental sustainability is emerging as a serious issue in sourcing, in manufacturing, and so on and so forth. And this presents significant opportunities for a country like Kenya. I'll tell you why. Um, Kenya right now has a, 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 an energy mix that is comprised of at least 97% clean energy. Uh, and the other 3%, we are basically moving to get rid of it uh, from our energy mix. What does this mean? It basically means that for anybody who wants to do manufacturing in Kenya and has products that require a high uh, contribution of energy, already gets a leg up when you are manufacturing in Kenya. So we are trying to tell this story, and we are also trying to get the investments that are necessary for us to have located in Kenya the kind of investments for people who want a green badge for their exports. Mm -hmm. And this becomes a very significant opportunity that I believe we need to um, 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 work on. And to conclude, um, when we reflect on global value supply chains, and when we reflect on our ability to participate in trade, we also realize then that we need to work significantly with the development partners, like the World Bank Group and so on and so forth, and we need to be able to open new markets and to negotiate in new markets so that we are able to have more markets for our products out there. We are, for example, working with the global trade team of the World Bank Group to basically help our negotiators understand and be uh, more effective in understanding the global trends. And that has also helped us with our current conversations that we are having with uh, uh, a number of our trading arrangements. We are also, for example, having uh, conversations with the finance competitiveness and innovation team that basically is putting up a significant jobs uh, 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 and economic transformation program that hopefully will also look at the key issues that need to be resolved on the export side. But allow me to conclude by saying that to participate in global markets, pre-COVID or post-COVID, to me makes little difference because there are significant foundational structural issues that are still not yet solved. And what do we need to do? We need to open new markets. We need to invest in investment-led trade whereby our proposition is to attract investment as a basis for trading in external markets. We need to leverage green energy that we have in abundant supply and create a magnet for that. We need to ensure that our export markets become pro-poor, pro-farmer, and pro-young people so that they're able to participate in external trade. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Al Al Alfred, for outlining okay. the, the challenges as well as the opportunities. Over to you, Annabelle. Uh, I think uh, let, let's start by saying that the multilateral trading system has played a very important role uh, in ensuring uh, developing economies are integrated into the global economy and framing their national policies. Now, given the uncertainties uh, and the lack of leadership currently in the system and, the, and a big discussion about WTO reforms, can you share how you're seeing the WTO reforms can help this continued agenda of trade and development uh, and, and any other issues like dispute settlement that you would like to raise? Over to you, Annabelle. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mari. I'm delighted to be here with our fellow panelists in, uh, in this event organized by, by the bank and uh, the Pearson Institute for International Economics. Though WTO reform may sound uh, technical and even uh, geeky, uh, it turns uh, to be anything but. Uh, you know, at a fundamental level, WTO reform is really about the global economy of the future. Without WTO reform, a situation where power replaces uh, rules in global trade relations becomes more likely. And that would hurt everyone and benefit no one. The cost of the resulting economic fragmentation would be massive, as much as 5% of long-term world GDP if the world economy would split in two self-contained blocks according to WTO um, estimates. So that, you know, to put it into context, that would be worse than the damage caused by the 2008-2009 uh, global financial crisis. And small and mid-sized developing countries uh, would be hit uh, the worst, as they would see their prospects for trade-led growth and development severely curtailed. So WTO reform is 
first and foremost about safeguarding trade's role as a tool to create jobs, reduce poverty, and increase, in, um, increase economic opportunity, especially in the poorest developing countries. Now, beyond that, WTO reform is also about promoting more resilient, more sustainable, and inclusive trade. So first, let me say a word on uh, resilience. Uh, turning inward and retreating from trade is hardly the answer to make economies more resilient to shocks. Uh, I think David and Adam uh, were referring to this before. Uh, on the contrary, what we need are deeper, more diversified, and deconcentrated markets alongside uh, with guardrails that protect against excessive uh, fragmentation. A reformed WTO can play a key role in several areas, improving transparency and monitoring to map concentrated trade relationships, promoting policy dialogue and coordinated solutions, and fostering trade facilitation to bring alternative supply sources into the global economy. Again, uh, David made a strong pitch for trade facilitation, and I would like probably to say a bit more uh, on that later on. Second, WTO reform is about sustainability. We need a reformed WTO to be able to leverage the global market for effective and ambitious climate action. And there are many ways that this can be done. For example, by reducing uh, the trade barriers that prevent green technologies from moving to where they are needed. The WTO must also play a bigger role in ensuring a just and fair climate transition, not least by ensuring that climate measures such as carbon border adjustments do not put exports of green goods and services from developing countries at a competitive disadvantage. And third, the WTO is about uh, WTO reform is about inclusiveness. We need a reformed WTO to allow new actors to tap into new sources of growth, especially for countries and businesses that have not been able to benefit from trade integration and as a result remain in the margins of the global economy. And though merchandise trade growth has uh, slowed, uh, Adam alluded to the great opportunities uh, that uh, services, that digitally delivered services in particular, uh, can bring. And this is a market and export opportunity that in 2021 amounted to $3.7 trillion. Uh, so so this is, this is uh, very, very uh, significant. And this is also the case of green trade. Now, turning briefly uh, to some of the specifics of WTO reform, let me say a word on negotiations and dispute settlement. So on the issue of negotiating new rules, our successful 12th ministerial conference last June demonstrated that uh, it still can be done, that there is still life in the multilateral approach. But we need to complement this with a basket of alternative rulemaking approaches so that willing members can move ahead on relevant issues without being held back by those that, uh, do not, uh, that are not ready to engage. And such alternative approaches are beginning to, uh, to deliver. We have delivered through lateral outcomes on services domestic regulations to slash red tape on, uh, on a services trade. Um, conclusion is within reach on investment facilitation. And the talks on e-commerce are proceeding. On disputes, the lack of a fully functional dispute settlement mechanism not only clouds uh, business perceptions of the uh, utility of the WTO, but it also weighs on negotiations and deprives developing countries, particularly small and mid-sized ones, from a unique instrument to ensure that WTO rules are applied consistently across WTO members, no matter their size. So that is one reason why having a fully functional dispute settlement mechanism is a top priority. Now, at the same time, I also have to say that the dispute settlement system is not frozen. The system is still being used by members. Members are also using alternative modes of dispute resolution. And in going forward, thinking in terms of a basket of tools for resolving disputes is something that could help us return to full functionality by 2024, the deadline that was established by our ministerial conference. So let me conclude by saying that WTO reform is likely to be a slow burn rather than a big bang. In fact, bits and pieces of WTO reform are already happening, but we need to accelerate the pace to ensure that WTO is fit for purpose in a more complex and rapidly changing trade policy landscape. 
And here I have to say, Mari, that the World Bank is a very constructive partner in our efforts to support WTO members to reform the WTO. So great thanks to, to you, to David, to Mona, to the whole team uh, for, um, for your, your strong support uh, and commitment for a revitalized WTO. Thanks, Annabelle. <laughs> okay, WTA reforms are not geeky, and we're looking at uh, slow burn and not big bang, but let's all work to get the big bang, uh, a, a bigger bang, uh, let's say. Uh, uh, Jeff, uh, I know you've been thinking about this uh, topic for uh, uh, some time, uh, and just want to get your take on, you know, we see the trend of, of fragmentation, the discussions on French shoring, near shoring. Uh, give me your take on how this impacts developing countries and what should be done. Well, thank you, Mari. And uh, of course, David and Adam's conversation at the beginning really laid out the key issues uh, that, uh, that are involved in, in, with your question. But if I were to point to one word that is the focus of all this French shoring, near shoring, it's the need for investment. Alfred pointed this out. Yeah. This is what we're really talking about. Some people are talking about how do you create the incentives to lure, lure the investment uh, into your country uh, by hook or crook, by carrots or sticks, uh, by trade preferences, by subsidies, by trade discrimination, uh, forcing that, uh, that flow of funds by economic sanctions for penalizing uh, countries or companies if you don't do it. Uh, I think Adam spelled out very clearly some of the costs of this discrimination uh, in lost opportunities and wasted resources. Uh, but uh, it's, it's clearly what has been prompting the discussion today because it's been focused, the French shoring has mostly been focused about China and what do companies and countries do facing the sh China shock, the shock of the trade war, rising costs in China, uh, the, uh, in, in very limited sectors, the economic uh, export controls that prohibit the flow of investment uh, to different markets. Uh, but there is, there, is, there is much more that needs to be done. I think the incentives the subsidies, the discrimination that the United States has put forward are, are actually very small. You may be talking about $50 billion but over, over five years, but it's, it's small in terms of the movement of funds and production, uh, the reordering of distribution networks uh, that are, uh, are, are at issue. And here I think one has to look at why French shoring has been in existence and, and important for the, tr uh, for the international economy for a long time, but it's just not been called that. Trade agreements create preferences that open opportunities for trade and investment. They're meant to encourage more opportunities. Economic reform, regulatory reforms, the investment in infrastructure and ports and, and logistical networks, that all uh, creates the environment for growth that, that Alfred was talking about. Uh, these are things that trade agreements over time have been uh, uh, promoting, uh, uh, opening opportunities for increased trade and investment, uh, or friendshoring, but you never hear anyone saying a trade agreement is is a tool of friendshoring, uh, and actually, uh, it is at its essence as long as it is it is it emphasizes the openness of opportunity and not uh, the cost of discrimination. I think this is what governments need to think about when they are pursuing these policies. Uh, they have to ensure that they are creating the climate to take advantage of these opportunities. Uh, so uh, encouraging the types of economic reforms that create the opportunities throughout the society. Uh, and and I, I, I think Alfred uh, in, in, in his own country create the opportunities for young people, uh, men and women to uh, move forward uh, in new technologies where there is an, an emerging uh, uh, growth. 
that's critical. And uh, to uh, support that with the infrastructure, whether it's physical or education, uh, and to work with trading partners and friends to uh, deepen regional uh, integration arrangements uh, to create new opportunities for secure and efficient sourcing of raw materials and components and access to the markets. Uh, this, I think, needs to be supplemented by the broader alignment of regulatory policies. Uh, this is something actually the United States is trying to do in the Indo-Pacific economic uh, uh, framework and in the Americas uh, 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 framework uh, and through its uh, bilateral initiatives and regional initiatives in Africa and elsewhere uh, to, to align regulatory policies that often as a practical matter determine whether, can enter, whether one can enter and compete uh, in foreign markets. So I think that is, is critical. I think the guidance of, of the work at the bank in, in promoting good regulatory practices and uh, uh, around, around the world is, is helpful and something that I think we can build on. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, I'm, I've been a, not a good moderator. We only have eight minutes or so for the second uh, set of questions. So if I can uh, get your indulgence to be very brief uh, in your answers. Let me uh, turn to, to Sunny. Uh, I think you already mentioned how you, you as a company, as a business, are responding uh, to the, these different challenges. Uh, if you can just also uh, maybe elaborate more on this diversification strategy, as well as uh, how do you respond to the, you know, you have a net zero commitment as a company, uh, and you mentioned a few things, but how, how else do you, uh, do you think you will uh, respond in the near future? You're yeah, muted. Sorry. Sorry, I'm sorry about that. Uh, I think the first is uh, to harness the power of technology in making a fundamental difference to becoming uh, climate positive or nature positive or livelihood positive uh, in the way we do our business. So, on the first part, in terms of being climate positive, we have launched uh, AI machine learning based. Uh, application uh, for being able to measure scope one, two, and three, particularly scope three. As you know, today only about 15% of the world's companies measure scope three, and 90% of those who measure scope three measure it inaccurately. So, how do you develop a more reliable measurement engine that can measure scope three so that you can meet your commitment mm -hmm. uh, uh, based on the SBTI 1.5 degree pathway? that if your total greenhouse gas emissions is more than 50% uh, uh, more than 50% uh, uh, of it is uh, scope 3 then you need to reduce it by two thirds by 2030 and reduce it by more than 90% by 2050 so this uh, is a product called terrascope we have launched it now started with people in the food and ag sector using it now we got other sectors who are on this net zero journey also adopting it so that's one example we want to be nature and biodiversity positive, which means we want to ensure deforestation free supply chains. And in order to be able to do that, we have got a forest loss risk index, which is again a digital tool that helps us anticipate which are the next potential landscapes that are vulnerable for deforestation. And then understanding the root causes of why that would be the case and trying to preempt uh, deforestations in those vulnerable landscapes. So that is an example for deforestation free supply chains. Okay. We want to make sure that our supply chains as much as possible, we can make them uh, child labor free, for example. Mm. And for that, you need to have very granular traceability systems mm. right up to the farmer level to be able to provide that uh, uh, granular traceability. Yeah. So I think harnessing the power of technology We've launched another uh, digital intervention called Jiva, which is a smallholder services platform. In the developing economies, more than 70% of our food is produced by smallholder farmers. Globally, 40% of the world's food is produced by smallholder farmers. Yep. How do you help them improve productivity and livelihoods uh, and get to a living income uh, through more targeted nudges on what is the next best action they can take on their farm 
to close the yield gap. China in 1960 had paddy yields of 1.8 tons per hectare. Today they are at seven and a half tons per hectare. Yes. And that is possible for other countries to do as well by adopting technology. Thank you. Thank you, Sunny, uh, for those uh, really valuable insights and what you're doing. Uh, to Alfred, uh, just quickly, uh, what do you think developing countries need to do to participate and be more proactive in the WTO reforms? And how do you see the role of the African continental free trade area as well as the bilateral agreements that I know you're negotiating with the U.S. play? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, thank you very, very much for that. Um, Kenya is extremely committed to seeing more trade on the continent. We see uh, very strong markets in places like the Congo, whereby we have endless demand for dairy products. We see endless demand for products in Sudan, where, for example, we have lots of opportunities for trade in manufactured products. We see lots of new markets in Ghana, Nigeria, and so on and so forth, whereby we are seeing markets for tea and so forth. So the Africa continental free trade area is going to remain a key instrument for us to actualize that. For that to work, we need to ensure that we thin the borders a bit more. It's still a bit more difficult to trade across borders within the continent. And notwithstanding lower tariffs, then it becomes an issue if then the borders remain something that's difficult to, 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 to use for trade. So that remains one of the issues that we really want to make sure that we work on. On the WTO, I see that it is extremely important for African countries to play a bigger role in the standard setting processes. Because if we are to trade and if we are to engage globally, then the standards around goods and services need to also reflect our contribution in a more meaningful way. Mm -hmm. And therefore, this therefore becomes a key developmental and trade issue for which you can expect us to be talking about more and more as time goes by. Uh, and uh, on uh, dispute settlement, we look forward to uh, a more uh, engaging stance uh, from, 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 from the WTO, whereby developing countries are able to actually engage in the dispute settlement process uh, in, in fairer ways. Mm -hmm. And finally, I think developing countries and African countries in particular we need to always keep looking at our trade defense instruments mm -hmm. and, and, and see how we can ensure that trade within the multilateral system remains fair and that we are able then to be able to, to, to detect instances whereby there's unfair play and mitigate that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Alfred. I think the standards and especially in the emerging Thank climate you. change in the emerging climate change uh, standards, whether it's CBAM and so on. This is a very key, I think, development and trade issue. Uh, Annabelle, uh, if I can just turn to you, uh, there are discussions about market opening in agriculture and services, and we heard uh, Adam earlier mention the potential for services, uh, and we also heard the role, of, uh, David uh, emphasized the role of trade facilitation. Uh, and I would add capacity building within that. What, what, is, the, uh, what, what, what is the WTO doing uh, with regard to that? And, and I, I see it as ways to get membership interest uh, in the WTO. Hmm. So there's no magic formula for restarting uh, uh, market access talks, but there are some things I believe that uh, the WTO and its partners, including the World Bank, can do to improve the prospects for such uh, talks. Uh, so let me mention three concrete actions. First, to improve uh, transparency of policies and regulatory uh, frameworks. Uh, Jeff was referring to this before. Second, to ramp up evidence-based research and policy dialogue on the effects of opening markets. And third, to expand technical assistance and capacity building, as you rightly mentioned, uh, Mari. Now, when it comes to services, I think these efforts must focus on the critical role of services in today's global value chains. And for developing countries, this means that specializing in services can have big payoffs in terms of scale, innovation, and spillover effects. Uh, take, for example, the ICT sector in India, uh, which is sustained largely by exports. Uh, it supports 16 million workers and has generated more jobs than any other sector over the past uh, two uh, decades. And let's also not forget the importance of um, having access to high quality and competitively priced services also uh, for manufacturing and agricultural competitiveness. 
Now, on agriculture, our efforts must focus on the role of agricultural trade in achieving many goals, from ending hunger to supporting the transition to net zero, uh, from helping countries buffer the impact of extreme weather events to grasping the opportunities that digitalization of farming offers to developing countries. Now, you, let me just say a word on what countries can do at home to rip the gains of trade in digital trade and green uh, products. So there are many, many things, but let me just mention uh, two elements. Uh, first, countries can and must work uh, to improve their trade policy and regulatory environment because this is critical to attracting the necessary investments to develop digital infrastructure and closing the digital divide, and also to improve digital skills and entrepreneurship. And one way to do this is to use WTO initiatives to anchor a process of domestic policy reform. For example, our agreement on services domestic regulation adopted by a, a large group of WTO members contains disciplines to cut red tape and foster transparency which will save service providers $150 billion each year. We have an agreement on investment facilitation that is being negotiated and hopefully finalized this year to help improve the investment climate. And again, our work on developing global rules on digital trade, uh, on digital trade can increase predictability, reduce fragmentation, and lower costs in the digital economy. We have, I think, a very successful example in the implementation of the WTO Trade Facilitation Agreement as a mechanism for anchoring domestic reforms to simplify and streamline their border processes and reduce trade costs, again, with strong support from partners uh, like the World Bank. Yeah. And finally, let me yes. just say that in a green economy, uh, developing uh, sound standards, certification, and quality infrastructure can help developing countries leverage uh, their green comparative advantage. Thank you. Thank you, Annabelle. So finally, over to you, Jeff. I uh, just want to ask you a question of, you know, we see the retreat of leadership in uh, the major economies in the, in the multilateral trading system. How do you explain uh, this retreat? And how do you also uh, deal with this anti-globalization movement that has, you know, the seeds of this anti-globalization movement is the perception, real or not, that there, the trade has not delivered, uh, uh, you know, equally uh, to everybody. Uh, how should we respond to that? Uh, and not to blame the trade policy, but what is the comprehensive approach that, we are, that will be needed? That's easy to do in one minute. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I think you hit the highlight that there are, are, are multiple and interrelated causes for the impasse in the multilateral trading system that we have seen for a long time. This is not uh, a new event. Uh, we've had a failure of WTO negotiations from the start to update uh, the, the rule book. Uh, and therefore, the WTO is not fit for purpose for 21st century trade, particularly in the area of services. Uh, we've seen an abuse of the consensus rule by both developed and developing countries. Uh, effectively, a veto by the big players that are not invested in maintaining and strengthening the system. That wasn't true during the GATT era. Uh, but then it was mostly the United States and Europe investing in the system and providing developing countries a free pass. Uh, now that everyone is invested in the system, we're seeing the major economies pulling back. Uh, in, in part, they're doing it by abuse of national security exemptions to justify industrial policy, by disabling multilateral enforcement, which enables unilateral enforcement and therefore goes against mm. the system. Uh, what has happened in the history of the trading, post-war trading system is that to get multilateral deals, you've had to have all of the big players agree, come together, and then they, they can provide the, the core for a, a, a broader agreement. Very hard in the, uh, to envisage how that's going to happen today with the United States, China, Russia in the system, uh, and the European Union, though being more proactive on WTO reform, still raising questions about uh, the carbon border adjustment mechanism. 
there is an opening for developing countries and middle powers to take up the leadership mantle and begin to say, we're the ones that need the disciplines, the reforms, the uh, common rulemaking the most to protect and, 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 and enable our economies. Take the leadership. Don't rely on the United States and China to do so. Uh, do what you're doing. Expand it beyond Africa, beyond Asia, uh, Southeast Asia. And we see, as Adam said uh, earlier, that this is what the CPTPP countries effectively have done uh, in, in the midst of a U.S.-China trade war. They have continued an, an open regionalism, uh, not just in the Asia-Pacific region, but for any country that wants to pursue an upgrading of their economic policies. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. I think I'm, I'm really running out of time, so I'm going to borrow a bit of time from the uh, concluding session uh, to take some questions. I'm going to take one question uh, online, uh, and then I will open it up for one or two questions uh, from the audience uh, here. I just want to also mention we have a, a large audience also following this uh, uh, online. Uh, so one question uh, from online, and I would like to ask uh, each one of you, uh, I will, I'll direct the question, or the, the questioner can also direct which uh, panelist they want uh, the, to answer. And then when you respond, all of you will respond at the end, as well as uh, give your final uh, remarks. Uh, let me uh, give you one question uh, from the floor. Uh, after COVID-19, what was learned about the role of international trade during the global health crisis? If I can ask uh, Sunny to give the private sector perspective, and then Annabelle to highlight uh, the role of the WTO uh, during this crisis. Just to highlight, there's a, a World Bank WTO trade and health uh, report uh, out there on the table, so please take a copy or look for it online. Uh, now let me open the floor for anybody here. Okay, the lady over there, and one more. One more. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you so much for the presentation. Actually, I want to follow up on what Alfred has said, that country, uh, countries in uh, Africa and developing countries are trying to have their in, um, initiatives uh, on a green uh, a free trade zone, for example, in Ethiopia, also now what Kenya is uh, thinking about. Uh, but the issue, according to many reports, including McKinsey, is that the problem with the green uh, agenda and the, implication of, and the application of that is not at the supplier's level. It's about what happens throughout the supply chain from the time uh, products get out of the country. And uh, so the issue is how to have all the players um, when the products uh, get out of the country, all the players, including shipping companies, multilateral uh, countries on the uh, exporting countries, uh, etc., to have them in sync to ensure that all the benefits of this green agenda um, is uh, realized. Uh, and also that will benefit in return the importing countries. Thank you. Thank you. Please uh, keep the questions short and tell, tell us who you want to, you, which panelists uh, or, or which panelists or panelists you want to Thank address. you very much. Um, so I think the, the question is general for all panelists of this panel and even eventually the, the previous. And um, so uh, we heard uh, from many from uh, a view that uh, basically to save trade, we need to look beyond trade, to competition, to product uh, regulations, to labor regulations. Uh, but we are still talking about a global agenda or a multilateral or a, uh, international agenda for trade, while these issues we are thinking at how to deal with them on a national scale. But this is a bit the recipe that we followed in the last 30, 40 years. So what is it that needs to change to make it happen this time? Thanks. Okay, I think I will uh, perhaps reverse the order <laughs> uh, and start with, so uh, I think you had uh, some qu one general question to all of you, uh, one question to Al Alfred, and then the COVID-19 uh, question to um, Annabelle uh, and Sunny. There was also another question actually on climate change and trade, and maybe Jeff, uh, from the online, maybe you can also address that, and then also give some wrap up uh, comments, but all in, uh, we're running out of time, so all in uh, one, one to two minutes at most. So, Jeff? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll focus on the last question because you're saying 
Are we doing the same thing all over again? In the past, it was really top down. Uh, and if you look at, at the trading system, the post-war trading system, it was designed on, on US law and practice. Uh, many people in Washington forget that. <laughs> but uh, to meet the challenges of the 21st century, it has to be bottom up. It has to be countries recognizing that for their own welfare, they need to work with their, with their neighbors and, and uh, develop a set of guidelines that will ensure the ability to produce, trade, finance, uh, uh, and, and grow all, uh, for, for the men and women, young and old, in their, in their societies. And that's not going to come from the United States or China telling you what to do. It has to be an awareness among the developing countries and the middle powers on how, on, on, on how to move the system forward. Thank you. Uh, so if I reverse the order, that means Anna, Annabelle, right? Did I get that right? Or did I get that right? I'll go ahead anyway. Uh, let me just briefly say that uh, contrary to uh, popular perception and uh, despite initial uh, hiccups, uh, trade played a critical role in making sure that, uh, that uh, vaccines, that uh, 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 therapeutics and diagnostics uh, reached all over the world. And the evidence is very clear. Uh, while in 2020, uh, trade decreased by 7%, trade in critical medical goods increased by 16%. So this is to show that in combating a health crisis such as the pandemic, uh, trade played a very important role, which goes more broadly to the role of trade in addressing global challenges, uh, the global challenges that we confront today, be it in terms of health, food security, uh, climate change, or others. So this is, again, one more reason to invest in WTO reform to make sure that it's fit for purpose to support this global challenges that the world faces. Thank you. Thank you, Annabelle. Alfred? Mm -hmm. uh, so thank you very much for uh, the question on, um, on, uh, on um, uh, uh, greening exports and uh, the, 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 the economic zones around that. I do agree with you that um, we need to look further than just what we are able to do in Kenya in as far as greening goods and services and look through the entire value chain, uh, how we are also sourcing products, whether those products are green in themselves and onwards uh, onto, towards the market. What we are saying is that we have a very good start and we have a start whereby we have clean energy, we are trying to commit to green principles in production, and then that already gives us a very good start for that. And I'm just hoping that uh, in conversations with development partners, for example, hopefully even with their finance competitiveness and innovation teams, for example, is that then we are able to think through what does it take in reality to have a green export strategy whereby the supply chains are also responsive enough for the product to arrive on the shelf premiumized and green. Thank you. Thank you, Alfred. Uh, last but not least, Sunny. I, I think uh, we've all uh, seen the importance of keeping uh, trade flows uh, and the uh, ability to access uh, food, feed, basic life essentials from whichever country has the most comparative advantage to produce that cheaper, better. Uh, and take it to destinations where it is most required and where there's a deficit of the production of these raw materials. Uh, and it is therefore unfortunate that we have the precisely the wrong policy response when we have disruptions like the one that we have seen from COVID or the one that we have seen from the Russia-Ukraine war, when more and more countries exacerbate uh, that supply-demand disequilibrium by uh, export bans and uh, import uh, tariffs and export tariffs, which uh, only worsens the situation. So coming back to the question that was raised from the floor about how can we uh, remove some of the uh, uh, vulnerabilities of uh, trade that is not uh, regulated or controlled in a way that the vulnerable sections of society who might be disadvantaged by more free trade, can we reskill 
or can be provided for or taken care of is an important lesson for us to have trade drive good quality GDP growth. Thank you. Thank you, Sunny, and thank you to all of you panelists. I, I'm sure all of you will agree that we've had a really great discussion with excellent panelists. More questions to be answered, but therefore <laughs> uh, more work for all of us to do. But uh, I will ask you to give a round of applause uh, to the panelists. And uh, now we'll move to the closing session. I think you can stay there or uh, okay. up to you. <laughs> stay there or uh, sit down. But yeah. uh, I'm going to reverse the order. I'm going to invite David first because David has to, to leave. Uh, and then I will uh, finish uh, with, with the second closing remarks. Uh, David, if you can come to the podium. Uh, and I beg your indulgence to go a little bit over 12. Uh, <laughs> David. I'm, I'm uh, happy to, and we are flexible here at the, at the World Bank. I want to first um, thank, <clears throat> thank very warmly Annabelle and Sonny and Alfred and Jeffrey. Uh, it's been a great uh, conversation. Also, I want to thank uh, Adam Poston. Um, it's been a great knowledge exchange, and so it's fitting that I'm here closing with Mari Pangestu. Um, she's been, uh, as, she, as she approaches the end of her term, term, Mari has been vital in the knowledge exchange of the bank, what, uh, events just like this, but also all of the, all of the uh, makeup of that for the bank. If I think back on the uh, arrival of COVID, uh, the, the uh, knowledge that was needed in the, uh, in the mobilization of the vaccines effort, I see Mamta Murti is here who was vital in that effort. As I think back on the, uh, the challenges uh, posed by food and fertilizer, I see uh, uh, Jürgen Vogler here uh, who was vital in that effort and still is. And I thought it was uh, very um, important that we heard Sonny's uh, closing uh, points about the, uh, about the difficulty of getting feed and, uh, for, and for fertilizer and uh, uh, foodstuffs around to uh, uh, various parts of the world. So these are all core things that Mari has been so instrumental in over the years uh, on, on trade and investment. I was very happy uh, that uh, Jeff mentioned the importance of, of investment. Uh, as we think about the private sector role in facilitating trade, it's going to be vital. And I, I, I think we heard Alfred uh, talk about the importance of sustained settlement. So as we're in this field of trade uh, liberalization and uh, facilitation, uh, the details matter of, of each way that the importers and exporters, whether services, goods, agricultural products, uh, actually exchange money and how that can be done in a, uh, in a, uh, uh, in a robust way. Um, one of the concerns I have, and I'll just mention, is the, as the, or I'll, I'll put on the table, a, uh, a big uh, problem facing the world. That's the absorption of capital is so intense by the advanced economies. As you think about the pr what's going on with pricing for the poorer countries, they're not buying the fertilizer they need to create the crop yields uh, that are out there. And under the surface, we're beginning to see rice prices go up. That's, a, that's an early warning sign. Uh, and we're beginning to see nutritional levels decline for uh, for people in the poorer countries. So it's a, whether you call it a, a pricing effect or a shortages effect, it's having this uh, impact uh, that, is, uh, that is at the core of the world's success over the next few years. So I'm troubled by that. I'm really uh, 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 very happy to have this uh, conversation today. Uh, and uh, I want to congratulate Mari on all she's uh, achieved here at the World Bank and thank her uh, for that, including today's fabulous panel. Thanks. Thank you, David. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you uh, so much, David, for those uh, kind messages. Uh, I, I will now try to uh, give a few key takeaways from uh, our excellent uh, session today. 
uh, and first of all, thank David for participating. Uh, at th that shows you the high level of priority we as an institution put uh, on trade and development. Thank Adam and Jeff uh, for the partnership with uh, Peterson uh, on this event and Annabelle. Uh, we have uh, continued partnership with you, uh, with the WTO, and of course, uh, thank you to Sunny for staying up, must be beyond midnight for you now, uh, to provide the private sector perspective and, and also to Alfred for uh, joining us today as the policymaker uh, developing country perspective. I think, uh, let me try to be brief, uh, we heard today uh, the, the challenges we are facing, we have slowdown in the world economy, where uh, subdued trade and investment is affecting, uh, affecting growth and development for developing countries in the foreseeable future. We see threats of disruption in economic and social systems due to climate and technological change, and we also see a rise in protectionism. Uh, by many countries, uh, but led by the largest global players. And this is uh, creating costly inefficiencies. I think we heard many uh, remarks on that. Risks of fracturing the open and rules-based trading system. And risks, especially to take away opportunities for developing countries to follow a trade-led growth uh, strategy. Uh, what we heard is also that whilst there are challenges and uncertainties, driving trade for development still matters. And, and I'm a great believer in that uh, myself. Uh, and we, we heard that there are new opportunities in trade that have emerged, such as green products and uh, services, especially digital-based services. If you look at the recovery of trade uh, post-COVID, actually ser business services recovered um, very quickly. Uh, and countries that have uh, been able to deliver on business services uh, have, uh, have been benefiting from that. Uh, and the best response to increase, increasing uh, resilience to shocks and security considerations of def def uh, dependence is still diversification. I think we heard Sunny uh, mentioning that in, in the case of his um, of his uh, remarks. Uh, and we saw how countries which are part of the global value chain were more resilient uh, and recovered faster during the crisis. But we also know realistically, the solutions that we have long relied on uh, may not be the most obvious pathways uh, moving forward to reap these opportunities, given all the geopolitical tensions. Uh, and we can expect the continued use of various instruments in the name of resilience, security, and national development. So really, uh, not to be blue, as the uh, uh, MC mentioned in the, in the beginning, I'm wearing red. Uh, I see some of you are wearing red because it's Valentine's Day. Uh, I think we need to look at the way forward. Uh, what, uh, we, we had a good discussion on the way forward. Let me reflect on three key messages about the way forward in terms of what we need to do to respond uh, in terms of policies, knowledge exchange, evidence-based policy making, and how the bank uh, can uh, inform on this. Uh, first uh, key message, taking the country uh, level uh, 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 perspective. I think uh, trade matters is really uh, what we are uh, wanting to, to emphasize. And our assessment actually shows that trade tensions that lead to fragmentation with higher barriers of imports and increased subsidies in advanced countries and China will hurt everyone, with the world economy uh, losing as much as 1.4 trillion, but hurts developing, developing countries more, with 52 million more people uh, entering into extreme poverty. This is the type, I think, of evidence-based uh, uh, information, and I know that uh, Peterson also has this kind of information to show the costs and that it hurts developing countries the most, not to mention small economies that depend on trade or landlocked countries that need connectivity. So the main message is that developed country actions that may be justified from national security, climate and in income inequality need to take into account their impact on developing countries. Similarly, developing countries that are also wanting to uh, conduct industrial policies also need to consider the impact on other developing countries. Or as Be uh, Jeff mentioned um, in, in our discussion just then before the event, how do we avoid beggar thy neighbor policies that benefit you but hurt at the expense of others? So how do de we design policies that can achieve the goals of whether it's resilience, security, or uh, addressing geopolitical concerns, but in the least 
or even industrial policy objectives in the least trade disruptive and costly ways. And this is where the bank uh, in its knowledge and evidence work uh, will continue its work on this and provide the voice for developing countries uh, in the current debate uh, on, on trade uh, and development. And furthermore, I think many mentioned, especially Alfred uh, was mentioning, that really the importance of investment in trade, uh, including the new opportunities in services, are there. And this is where uh, we need uh, to accelerate our evidence-based analysis and continue to support developing countries to design the right kind of policies and institutions. That's still the, I guess, uh, the bread and butter or the usual uh, policies about how to attract investment. I think many of you mentioned that and how to have a, uh, attract investment that will lead you to a trade-led growth and development, which includes trade facilitation, efficient infrastructure and logistics, conducive investment climate and capacity building that will improve the functioning of domestic markets uh, and institutions. And I think there was a mention of trade finance. How can we help the tea traders uh, really access trade finance? Uh, and how do we reduce the thick borders? And I think uh, attention should be put, uh, this pushback on globalization. I was a trade minister and uh, uh, the amount of blame that trade gets uh, on, on all the ills and all the uh, downside uh, of, of the economy is, is really something that's just easily targeted. So attention needs to be put on complementary policies that ensure that we can have the benefits of trade uh, are, that are more equally distributed. And this includes inclusiveness, human capital, pay, paying attention to human capital and gender and so on. Second, new trends uh, in technology, climate, supply chain resilience and industrial policy are cre creating challenges and opportunities. So it's both challenges and opportunities for developing countries. But we need to monitor uh, all this to ensure transparency and fairness. And I think Alfred mentioned the point about standards. Uh, and it's key that measures in the name of climate, for instance, uh, are transparent, that are not unilaterally determined, uh, that do not distort trade, in the, uh, in the guise of protection. And this is where the multilateral discussion on trade and environment and how it impacts development needs to happen. It's about uh, transparency of subsidies, making them targeted and time bound, supporting data collection uh, on, uh, and analysis on trade in services, and uh, also uh, understanding better uh, the types of smart versus costly industrial uh, policy and understanding better trade costs. For businesses, understanding the uh, trade costs is really key. And then finally, not to be gloomy about the multilateral trading system. Uh, it's, it's not geeky, as, uh, as uh, Annabelle said. Uh, maybe it's a slow burn. Uh, maybe it's, uh, we can work on a big bang, but we can also explore opportunities while uh, we have a, a lack of leadership and maybe a slow process of reforms. What can be done? Uh, because uh, we still need uh, the frameworks to underpin uh, trade and uh, trade policies as well as certainty for the private sector. I'm speaking as a former trade minister where a lot of our trade reforms that we did or even investment reforms and policy reforms were to attract investment but they were done with a framework of what were the national, uh, what were the international uh, frameworks uh, and standards. So we, we will be working on this uh, together with the WTO uh, but uh, just to mention two opportunities uh, while we are facing uh, uncertainties and lack of leadership uh, in, the, in the multilateral trading system was the notion of club of clubs and open regionalism. I would say open club of clubs and open regionalism. The key is open. Club of clubs is about having uh, like-minded countries move together where they can, and it doesn't have to include uh, China and the US. Uh, it can be the, uh, the JIS, Joint Initiative on Services. It can be on digital, but they need to be open. I know the digital one is open. Even if you're not ready yet to sign on to the negotiations, you can participate and listen. And believe me, just by participating and listening is already capacity building for many developing countries, just to think about uh, what these uh, new areas are. 
and then open regionalism uh, with the African continental free trade area, CPTPP, in, Maya, in the East Asia region, it's the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership of East Asia. These can uh, reduce thick borders, they can, it's not just about tariffs, as Alfred said, uh, reduce the thick borders, uh, do it in a way which is deepening and broadening, open to, to members, open club, uh, and uh, link it to the open, uh, to the multilateral uh, system. I'm just going to quote one of your uh, uh, founders of P Peterson, Fred Ber Bergsten. Keep the bicycle moving. <laughs> That's what he always said, you know. Uh, just however way you can do it, just keep the bicycle moving. So let me close on that note, uh, optimistic note, uh, that I'm not blue. Uh, I'm uh, a half full uh, glass person and I hope that all of you uh, will work together with us uh, as partners, as collaborators uh, and to support countries like Kenya to really achieve not just a slow burn, but uh, if it's not a big bang, at least uh, a certainly significant impact for development for the people that matter uh, in these countries. Thank you very much and thank you all of you for coming uh, today. Recording stopped.